say with me the wow in and of our proclamation. Part, part four. So how about we begin this morning with a pop quiz? Now, is that a question or a statement? Whatever the case, it's not a part of the quiz. You don't get any points for getting that right or wrong. You remember how you loved those when you were in high school. With, you, you kids that are in high school, they're in the next service. They're all over in the blue building now. Kayla, you're in high school. Do you get pop quizzes? All the time? Do you like them? No. Anybody ever liked pop quizzes when you were in school? No. Uh, you did. That's because you're smart. And you didn't care if you got a pop quiz or not. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> I hated them. <laughs> anyway, we're going to have a pop quiz because it's been about two weeks since we've looked at our subject. The wow in and of our proclamation. So question number one, were we, that is you and me, the human race, created in the image of God? The answer is yes or no. So if you'd like, you could take your news, an envelope, and you're going to jot these down because there's five questions and it'll total 100 points. So I want to see what your score is when it's all over. So how many of you said yes? Just write yes. How many of you said no? Just say no. And if you said yes, you got 20 points. It is correct. You, we, human beings, are made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 tells us. God created man, read with me, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So you know how you turned to your neighbor during the greet and said, you know, you, you are made with value and purpose. Now I want you to look at your neighbor because now you won't be uncomfortable. You've already done that once. And just say, you were made in the image of God. Now look at him closely and say, you're made in the image of God? <laughs> now sometimes that's hard to, uh, to, to grasp, right? But it's true, we are made in the image of God. Question number two. The term given by Christian theologians to that moment in time when God put on flesh and became a man is called the incarnation of Christ. Is that true or false? You got your little envelope? You got a pen in front of you? Write it down. That time in history when God put on flesh and became a man, is that known or referred to by theologians as the incarnation of Christ? How many of you said yes? How many of you didn't know? How many of you said no? If you said yes, you got another 20 points. You're at 40 on your way to 100. Here it is, look. John 1, 14. The Word, come on. Came flesh, Don't die on me now. Full of grace and truth. Theologians call that the incarnation of church, of, of Christ. I was thinking how oftentimes you go by a church and it's called the church of the incarnation. And it's referencing when God put on flesh through his son, Jesus, and became a human being. Question number three. Was there a purpose in God putting on flesh and becoming a man? Was there a purpose for God putting on flesh and becoming a man. If you said yes, give yourself another 20 points. You're doing good on your pop quiz. You're at 60. How cool is that? It's still a failing grade. Yeah. <laughs> but I will give you the rest of the questions. Question number four. Sorry to do this to you. It's not true or false. It's not yes or no. It's an essay question. But you can answer this with two words, by the way. In fact, last night somebody answered it with one. They nailed it. 
What was God's purpose? We said he came, he put on flesh. Now the subsequent question is, what was his purpose? So it's an essay. Go ahead, write it down. Log it in your brain. Push the save button. Now it's time to talk back to your pastor. So what would you say? Two words. What was his purpose? Uh, uh, one at a time. Raise your hand. Like in school. Yes, Catherine. To save. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, Ben. Redemption. Ah, that's what the lady said last night. You got it in one word. Yes. Listen, the purpose for Christ putting on flesh, although he opened blinded eyes, although he straightened crippled limbs, although he dealt with social injustices, and all of those things, his real purpose and main purpose, and really only purpose, if we bring it down to one, was to seek and to save that which is lost. Because every person born of woman is lost in their, trans, in their uh, trespasses and sins. Look at this. John 3, 17. That's why we selected it. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world, come on, through him might be saved. And then I love this. This is Paul addressing his son in the faith, Timothy. This is a trustworthy saying. Finish it. Now you're quiet. Come on, talk back to me. It's not that early. And everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world. Here it is. To save sinners. Oh, man, have you ever been there? Whew. I'm there far too often. I say, how in the world can I get in the pulpit this week, Lord? You know, and then i got to get away for about three hours and do a Yom Kippur. Or, <laughs> but I'm using the real stuff, you know, not trying to wash my mind. Trying to wash my spirit and my soul and say, goodness, Lord, I'm just the worst of the worst. There can't be a worse sinner on this planet than me. I'll give you an illustration. I can't stand... In fact, I hate with a passion what the news media is doing to our country. They feed man's flesh with anger, dissension, and hatred. They create division on every front, financially, morally, spiritually, and racially, and seem to not care what the consequences are. I've never lived in a more economically and racial, uh, racially tense world. And I'm over 60. I've never seen what I'm seeing today. I thought we were one nation under God, not one nation divided under God. Two wrongs never make a right. They only create a fight. And if you don't remember anything else from the sermon, remember that. Two wrongs never make a right. They only create a fight. You think about what Jesus did with our wrong. He absorbed it so that he might bring to us the peace rather than create division and throw it back on us. When I listen to the rhetoric, the hatred, the fighting, the instigation, sometimes I'll be watching the news. And you know, I tell you that. I flip back and forth between CNN and Fox because I figure the truth is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> you got to get both sides, you know. So sometimes I'll be sitting there and I'll be listening to just this divisive speech ripping us apart as a nation. And I'll say to myself, God, just strike that guy with a stroke. <laughs> right on the spot. Shut him down. Put the fear of the Lord in everybody. And then all of a sudden I think, that's not very Christian. 
How many times has that happened to me? I don't want God to strike me with a stroke because I thought something or said something I shouldn't think, you know, and all of a sudden I realize that's not such a good idea. <laughs> yes. And then I'm reminded of the verse in 2 Peter 3, 9. For the Lord is what? Long-suffering. I love this word. I, 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 I know the new, new translations say patient, or the Phillips says very patient, but long-suffering is a far better word. It means God suffers with us long. And I think all the times God suffers with me, puts up with me long, like not just a month or two months, but a year or two years or three years or four years or more. You know what that is. He tells you to put something out of your life and you just manage it. I can handle this, man. I got this thing managed. You know, and he said, I didn't tell you to manage your sin or your disobedience. I told you to put it out. Long suffering. And then I just have to stop and say, thank you, God, that you're long suffering, because if not, I'd be a dead man. Amen. Thank you for that one amen, Ben. <laughs> you all should have said amen. Let's try it. Amen. Yes, but he's long suffering. Why? Not willing that any of us should perish. He's giving us that time to get where we need to be. Maybe. Just maybe. There are times when people call a stroke down on me. I'm glad God didn't hear me. Listen to these wise and profound words. Oh, by the way, because it's underneath and I got to put it somewhere else because it's going to mess me up. Sermons now are, no, are not only in English in the main lobby, if you want a transcript, but they're in Spanish. So those of you who are more comfortable, or you have a family, you can pick one up. Listen to this. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie, nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. And so it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Martin Luther King understood that two wrongs never make a right. They only create a fight. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And it's time that we as a nation love or hate will rule us. So back to the question. What was God's purpose in becoming a man? To save sinners. So if you have that, you now have scored an 80. You're only 20 points away from 100. Question number five, two parts. I give it to you in two parts. If the Son of Man was born with and for a purpose, and we are created in the image of God, were we born for and with a purpose? Yes or no? Yes. yes. If you put yes, give yourselves 10. 
So you're at a 90. I don't think that's quite an A, right? When I was in high school, an A was, what, 93 or above? Is that correct? How about you guys? Somewhere around there? So here's the second part. Since you were born with and for a purpose, do you know what that purpose is? We just said, yes, I was born with value and purpose, promise and potential. Do you know what it is? So maybe this will help you out a little bit. It's a hint. So here we go. The revealed truth of the Trinity is at the core of the Christian faith. And so from antiquity, we have begun our prayers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our God is one, but he is a communion of persons, not solitary. And we are invited into that kind of relationship with him in and through Jesus Christ. So those of you who come from a Roman Catholic background, Anglican, high church, orthodox, you do this. Or maybe you do it this way. And you look at it as you're saying, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in actuality, I want you to see how rooted in the depths of this tradition, which has been overshadowed by its rhetoric and its, retip, its repetitiveness, is such a profound truth. You know how that is as Protestants. We run from everything that's Catholic or, or high church. Oh, something's wrong with it. Look at the power in this. You know what this says? tells you why you were born and for the purpose for which you were born. We are to love, look at this vertical beam. We are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Come on. And we are to love our neighbor as ourself. It's the horizontal beam. So you don't have to ask yourself, what is my purpose? Why was I born? Because God tells us. He summarizes it in the two great commandments. It's this. It's the vertical beam to love God. It's this, it's the horizontal beam to love your neighbor as yourself. So whenever you wonder, you know, what is my purpose? Be Catholic for a day, it won't hurt you any. You know? I was born to love God. And I was born to love my neighbor. Is that so hard? That's the purpose for which you were born. How many of you got both of those? That's two tens, that gives you a hundred. If you got a hundred, come see me after church. Maybe I'll give you a hundred hour bill. If there's too many of you, maybe I won't. So Dr. Gordon Henry, who will be with us missions weekend, he would say to me, he's in his 80s now, but we've had him at the church for 35 years. We were back in the PMC building, our first service. And he would say to me, Pastor, you, you have to do more than just tell people what they are to do. You have to tell them how they are to do it. Don't tell them just what to do. Tell them how they are to do it. Can I go one step further? All six of you, thank you. Can I go one step further? Yes. Not only must we as parents, we as pastors, we as ministry leaders, we as Sunday school teachers, not only must we tell ourselves and those that God has placed under our care what to do and how to do it, we must tell them why we do it. We live in an age where only 8% of everybody 35 years of age and under goes to church. 8%. If, if you look at that, that's 92% of those 35 and under don't go to church. Look at your own family. And if you have those 35 and under, and 9 out of 10 of them go to church, so to speak, you're the rarity. And I'm convinced 
It's because we've fallen into this um, whatever it is where we just tell our kids, you know, just don't do this. But we never tell them why they're not to do it. Because it's in the why that we face the struggles of life. I want to give you some examples. We say to our children, <clears throat> start the day off with the Lord. Read the word and pray. Now, my second question would be, do you train them to do that? See, that's the how. <clears throat> our kids <clears throat> weren't allowed to start the day until they took a moment and prayed, usually with us, and they uh, read the Bible. Now, they had a choice. They could read their children's Bible or they could watch, a, at the time it was called Superbook. And they would always pick the Superbook because it was a lot more entertaining when you were a child. But they couldn't start the day unless they started it with the Lord. Now, why? If you just say to your kids, this is what you're supposed to do, this is how you're to do it, but you don't tell them why, then when they get old enough, they're just going to drop like, who cares? I don't know why. Why do I do this? You do it because the Lord said, give us this day our daily bread. And we understand, right, Don, that we can't enter the day on our own, God forbid, because there's a way that seems right to a man, and the end thereof is death. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, what? Train up, no, I'm sorry, <clears throat> Lean not, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And those of us who've been around for any length of time, we understand what it is to walk into the day and not have stopped to pray and not have stopped to put God's mind in our hearts. It's interesting. I, I was talking to Mildred this morning. You know, and, and many of you know Mildred is... 99 years old, eight months shy of 100. Right here in the black and white, black hat. She is my inspiration every Sunday. Comes in early before anybody else, backs her car into her spot, drives at 99, we won't go there. But anyway, comes in, parks, and we were talking, and you know what she said to me? I said, I pray that I'm anywhere close, Mildred, to where you are, just physically. Her mind is as brilliant as any person you'd ever meet. You know what she said to me? She said, because people often talk about God and they believe in God, but they never draw on the spirit of God. It's the spirit of God in me that keeps me alive. The spirit of God in me that keeps me alive. And we know that. We walk into the day and the day gets messed up. And what do we do? We pull over to the side of the road or we get alone somewhere and we pray. Why? Because we've learned that we can't get through the day without God. Now, it's kind of hard to teach a young child that or a teenager. They don't quite understand it yet. But if we can lay the why early, don't worry, don't understand. It's sort of, you know, that we have, um, <clears throat> as a family, we have, uh, my daughter's adopted this, just, she's my chocolate kiss. She's my favorite person on the planet. I'm sorry, but she is. And she's just brilliant. I, I, I used to say to her, you know what, Eden? When you're four years of old, I'm putting a tennis racket in your hand. You're going to be the next Serena Williams, and you're going to take care of your grandpa when I get old. But now I realize how bright she is. I tell her she's going to be the next Oprah Winfrey, and she's going to take care of her grandpa when she gets old. But, you know, I can tell her not to do something, and she does it anyway. For instance, if I put a candle in the room, and I light it, and I say to Eden, don't touch the candle, do you think that's going to go anywhere? No. She's going to touch it. Because we're drawn to the flame. And the church said, yeah, we're drawn to the flame. Now, once she touches it, do I have to tell her not to touch it? No. no. The other day I had a cup of hot tea. And so she came over. She always wants to drink what Pop-Pop drinks, right? So she came over and she went to drink the tea and she sensed it was hot. And she goes, no, Pop-Pop, hot. And I said, no, it's not too hot. You can handle it. 
No, hot. She wouldn't touch it. Why? She learned the why. It's not just what. It's not just how. It's why. That we have to instill. So some years ago, I got four minutes. Am I going to get through here? Because we have baptisms today. Let me go. Thank you. Thank you for that one solo amen to my right. <clears throat> so some years ago, I did this Y series. And it was relational to guaranteed Christian growth. And I think out of all the guaranteed growth series, this is my favorite. Just because after you teach the same subject, you know, every year for 30 years in a row, you, you come up with a different angle. But this, this is just like the, the cornerstone of it all. Why the assurance of salvation? Why read the Bible? Why prayer? Why baptism? Why regular church attendance? Why tithe? It's cool. Wednesday night I was visiting the classes and I was in the Royal Rangers class. And, and it was their level 9 to 12 year olds because, you know, they go all the way up to high school. And, it, and they were teaching them the principles, the financial freedom. Work, tithe, budget, give the right place. And I'm in that class and I'm listening to these, these teachers teaching 9, 10, 11, 12 year olds the principles, the financial freedom. Tithe, give God the tenth. Work, Lord said six days, unless you can't. And then we trust that our beloved family will take care of that. Work, tithe, budget. Don't spend more than you make. It's that simple. You may have to simplify your life, but don't live above your means and you'll be happy. Work, tithe, budget. Give the right place. That should be your storehouse. And there these young kids were learning that, the why. I thought, man, that's good teaching. If your kids aren't in Royal Rangers, they ought to be. Just keep it at that. Why tell others? Why church membership? Why serve? Why must we, we run to win? Not just the what, not just the how, but the why. And here's one other thought. We will never truly know God until we obey him. You can know about God. You can read the Bible and know about God. But until you obey God, you'll never understand who he is. It's in our obedience that our purpose is revealed. That's how we know God. As long as you live in disobedience, you'll never know him. Well, you'll know, my dad used to call it the Pocky Pockies. That's when the Board of Education is put on the seat of learning. Works really good. Believe me, I had enough of those in my day. And for those of you who raise your kids without it, you're missing something. So are your kids. Never heard them at all. So I'm going to talk to you teenagers for just a minute. <clears throat> if you want to understand the beauty of genuine love, don't have sex before you're married. Now that's the don't, right? That's not the why. So let me give you the why. Because disobedience translates into damaged emotions, stolen gifts, unwanted pregnancies, and the list goes on. Obedience translates, obedience translates into wholesome, uncompromised, unparalleled oneness. And if you'd like a little further explanation on that, there's a beautiful pocket-sized paperback book written by your pastor called Love, Lust, and Lies. You can pick one up in the bookstore. You want to understand the euphoric presence of God? Be still. You'll never know the euphoric presence of God until you stop and you're still in his presence. Psalm 46.10. And if you want to lay hold of the true joy of life, Serve others. Serve others. 
The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for others. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're saying to me, Pastor, I don't know how in the world to get there, can I suggest to you that you have a loving pastoral staff, ministry leaders, Sunday school teachers, come to us. There's 101 ways to serve God at this church. And if we can't find a place for you to serve here, we'll find a place for you to serve somewhere else. But you'll never know the joy of a life until you serve. There's something special Amen. about serving God. I was thinking the other day, and this is kind of off the subject, and my, I'm 45 seconds over. I was listening to the news, and they were saying that the government spends $65 billion in Pakistan alone, just in the embassy. $65 billion. Now, I don't understand all the you know, foreign uh, military needs and protecting our freedoms. I'm not going to step on that. But I thought of something. What would happen if the government took $65 billion and gave it to all the churches that feed the poor, that have a, a soup kitchen, that reach out to the homeless? How would that transform our world? I thought we would never see it the same way again. How we just think wrongly, in my opinion, we don't understand this, see. Be quiet. It's all right, as long as it sinks in. Go home and shout it. I'll accept it. So do you know Jesus? Your purpose will never come to life till you know him. Can we stand? say, Pastor, how do I know him? It's as simple as ABC. It really is. You start with an act of humility. You admit the truth about yourself that you're a sinner. God's holy, you're not. And the things that you do wrong separate you and me from a holy God. We A, I think that'll come up on the screen. We admit that we're sinners. B, we believe the truth about God, that he did something about it in the person of his son, Jesus. Who came, put on flesh, went to a cross, take upon himself all of our wrong deeds called sin that separates us from God. C, we commit our lives to him, to his righteousness, not the church, not the sacrament, not mom, not dad, him. The only one who lived a holy life took upon himself our sin so that the Father wouldn't see it. And D, there's a day when we do it. Just like there was a day you had a physical birth, there's a day that you have a spiritual birth. So let's pray to that end. Can we close our eyes and shut out all the distractions? Pray something like this. Just say, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. I admit to you that I've done things that are wrong and you've called those things sin. So I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I believe you sent Jesus who took upon himself my sin. Thank you. Today I commit my life to you. I want to be your disciple. I trust your righteousness and my, my own. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. Be my Lord and Savior.